Are you aware of the arguments of the Anthropic Principle? Do you think that Dawkins defeats them in The God Delusion? What do you make of what he says, and what is exactly the force of the Anthropic Principle? What exactly are we meaning when we talk about the Anthropic Principle? That's the first thing that should be on our minds when we start looking at these arguments. The thing that we have to treat carefully in this particular question is we have to define exactly what we mean when we're talking about anthropic principle, but we also have to ask ourselves specifically um, what exactly the arguments of Dawkins in his book The God Delusion are in opposition to the anthropic principle. First, a little bit of history. When we begin the um, story of the scientific revolution, one of the things that we keep in mind is that there is not a competition between theism and scientific discovery. These two things are happening side by side, often in completely overlapping contexts. The early scientists of the Enlightenment and particularly of the scientific revolution, such as Sir Isaac Newton, big names that you would associate with that particular um, insight, don't see a competition between religion and science, between divine activity and human observance of it. There, there's simply not that vocabulary yet. One of the things that um, happens during this time is the discovery of several constants um, where are things objectively in the universe that we can base our measurements off of in a reliable fashion? The reason why this is important is because when you measure anything, you are always using a reference in order to measure something accurately. That reference can be a relative measurement in that, let's say, I'm wanting to measure how tall a book is. I can measure it based upon the relative position of where my arm is, okay? So I can measure a book up here by, it is approximately two hands long. But, of course, when we talk about this being two hands long, what we really mean by that is that it is two hand lengths of specifically my body length long, and specifically my left hand of my body long, which might be different from my right hand, it begins to uh, introduce a problem. How do we accurately measure something from an objective standard rather than from a relative standard? What is something that we can reliably say is an accurate measurement in the first place? This begins a search for objective measurements. We have to be able to measure things in uh, a way that is consistent and translatable from an objective point of view, not simply a relative point of view. By the way, this is where uh, the arguments between the imperial system and the metric system really become hot uh, and heavy, um, is, is it better for us to have a base 10 system in the metric system or to have the imperial system of 12 inches in a foot, of 36 inches in a yard, and so on and so forth, um, that are based off of relative measurements that we have standardized, but that aren't something that we can observe within the universe at any point in time and say, that's an objective measurement. Such as, my hand is simply not going to exist in perpetuity, and so therefore um, the relative measurement of my hand can be simply lost to time. This becomes really, really important when we start measuring the observable forces in the universe. The force of gravity, the speed of light, and things like that. In which we're able to actually determine some principles that actually show these things to be approaching an objective standard. You might have heard about there is a speed of light. Well, there is a speed of light in a vacuum that is a constant, thank goodness, that we can base other areas of measurement off of reliably, based upon what we know about the principles of light that act in the universe. And again, I say light in a vacuum. It's not that light travels the same um, speed whenever it has to travel through a medium, such as air or things like that. 
I'm bringing this up because there are certain objective things that we observe within the universe from our scientific point of view that when we begin to ask the question, why does the universe exist in the first place, or why does life within our solar system exist in the first place, or to be even more specific, why does life on Earth exist in the first place, we then have to weigh the measurements of what exactly are the um, probable arisings of life based on, and what sorts of preconditions do there have to be for life to exist in the first place? All of what I just said brings us to the anthropic fine-tuning principle, which is what they're dealing with right here. And that particular principle is that there are a significantly finite amount of things that can be changed about our universe. And in fact, so insignificant that if certain things were even uh, a hair's breadth, so to speak, different, life would not have been able to arise in the way that we have theories around life arising in the scientific processes. In the Anthropic Principle, there are six principles that are so fundamental that we can treat them as objective standards of forces, and that these objective standards, if they were even ever so slightly different, would have completely disallowed uh, the even uh, building block idea that life could have arisen in the way that we see it. Based upon the anthropic principles put forward in these six preconditions, of the universe to be able to exist in the ways in which we are reliably able to observe it, these particular dimensions of the world are used in an argument for the fine-tuning of the universe. This is what is being referred to as the Anthropic Principle. In the Anthropic Principle, this is also premises built into a larger argument in the Anthropic Principle, which is that the highest probability explanation for these being the preconditions that the universe could even exist in the way that we could ever have understood it in the first place is an action of divine intelligence. In other words, that there is an intelligence that has finely tuned the systems of the physical universe such that life is able to arise in the first place. This is a broad, 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 broad argument that is simply positing there is an outside creator of the universe that has set these particular principles in such a way as to finely tune the arising of life in the way that we have been able to describe it based upon the physical laws of the universe. And again, all of that is trying to say is that it's an argument for not only the existence of God, but of the intention of God in the creative aspect. God created the universe and life be in these particular ways in which God in the sort of infinite uh, mind of God created these preconditions and enlivens, inaugurates, is involved in those particular things such that life actually arises and operates in the ways in which God has created it to do so. That is what the Anthropic Principle is roughly saying. One other um, uh, scientific writer has put it in this way. These, you know, the particular constants I just told you might make your eyes glaze over, but here's an analogy. If you have a cake that is, say, the size of the sun, it would be if any one of these particular things, um, these fundamental forces of the universe, um, in order for life to arise, it would be as if the accuracy of these measurements of these constants were the equivalent of one single grain of sugar being the right proportion in a cake the size of the sun. In other words, if these were in any other ratio possible than what their particular parameters are, it would not have been possible for the universe to exist in the way it does, 
much less the solar system to exist in the way that it does. And so what this leaves is, as John Polkinghorne and Nicholas Beale say, this leaves really only a couple of options for explanation as to what exactly this means. The first is this, that God created the universe. Because the universe is so finely tuned and that these principles are so intricately determined as, you know, these constants that would have completely um, changed uh, not only the length of the universe existing for only a split second or simply have exploded, <laughs> Um, but that anything that exists within the universe itself is causative by these actually being accurate. And that, therefore, the things that we see within the universe actually existing in the first place exist. And that in the loving wisdom of God, there was a both a precondition and a sustaining activity of God in all of these ways such that life arises in the way that it does. So I said we were able to actually have this conversation, if it makes sense. That's number one. Number two is that it's all just a big, happy accident. That the universe just so happened to have these particular sets of circumstances at a completely random interval, that it arises out of a complete accident that things are that are. So number two is basically it's all just a big, giant accident. Number three. This one is the most interesting one. But we simply happen to operate in this particular dimension of reality, or this particular universe of reality, in which there are multiple universes. Now, again, this is one of those things that we were going to talk about here in several different chapters. But if you propose that there are simply a significantly large number of universes, and we simply happen to be living in one of them that survived, does this sound familiar? If it does sound familiar, it's that this is the current pop culture expression based upon what several scientists have tried to argue for. And as John Polkinghorne basically says, this is a convenient thing to argue for if you really, really, really don't want to go with option number one, that an outside divine intelligence has designed this. But again, we'll get to that here in just a moment. The fourth one is, again, one of those uh, sort of... Um, arguments that is an argument from ignorance. We simply don't know the forces that would have caused the universe to arise randomly. In other words, that the universe did cause was caused randomly, but we simply don't have access to the full scale how the universe happened accidentally. Which again, the reason why this is an, uh, th that this fourth particular point is actually a logical fallacy is because an argument from ignorance is simply we don't know the preconditions of which this has arisen Therefore, it is still, still my pre, my a priori assumption about this, but we simply don't know the things that are happening yet. This is, by the way, the exact same line of argumentation that God of the Gaps takes. In other words, I can't explain it, God explains it. Again, Dawkins is very uh, ready to bring up this particular argument, except that the opposite can be true. The universe has arisen randomly, we simply don't know the preconditions of which has arisen randomly, but it still has arisen randomly. In other words, um, the, uh, there, is, uh, there is something that doesn't follow from that argument, and it's the same sort of argument that simply puts science in the place of God. I can't explain how the universe has ha happened randomly, but science someday will. An argument from ignorance is not an argument. It is a fallacy to argue this. And this is what Polkinghorne and Nicholas Beale point out pretty readily. All of that to say, the anthropic principle is a fine-tuning argument. That's the first part of this question. The second part of this question is, did Dawkins defeat these particular arguments? Here is where getting into the weeds is going to be required, which, by the way, is why we're only doing dealing with two questions this week. This is a significant bit that we need to discuss. The first is that if we make the position that there are multiple dimensions or multiple universes, if there are multiple dimensions beyond what we see, or multiple universes beyond what we see, where did they come from, and what physical principle of the universe gives rise to the possibility or evidence that these actually exist? Because of the ways in which fundamental physics operates, we simply don't have evidence that other universes exist. 
Now again, this might literarily be a fun thing to play with, such as in the Avengers, um, as we talked about in a, a previous class, but the whole idea that there are multiple universes, that's a, that's a big thing within the Marvel Universe right now, right? Um, that there are multiple Spider-Mans from different dimensions of reality and things like that. Again, it's a great literary device. The problem is, is that, is that actually the way that reality functions? Polkinghorne and Nicholas Beale, and likewise Stephen Hawking at the end of his life in his memoir, believe that it's pointing towards scanter and scanter evidence that this is the case. But rather that we're kind of stuck with the universe we have. And if that's the case, there are some arguments within um, the book that uh, Dawkins writes that fall on um, a little bit of those particular arguments that are beginning to have less and less strength behind them, such that multiple universes exist, therefore the one that we're in is simply a relative one. But the other particular point that at least uh, Dawkins as a biologist attempts to bring up is that this is simply a random aspect of the way that the universe functions, and that we see in biology randomness happening all the time. Now, again, go back to a couple of weeks before when we talk about randomness and what we mean by randomness. But what Polkinghorne actually wants to push back and say is that actually, when we kind of follow the uh, line of logic in the bare physical sense, what we actually see is rather than simply things arising randomly, it is less explanatorially powerful to say that all of this simply happens as a happy accident than for six different constants having to be minusculely accurate. In other words, accurate to the nth degree for any number of things in the universe to be able to happen at all, for reality to even exist. And for Polkinghorne and Beale, the more powerful assumption is that this is not by accident, that this is by an architect in which this happens. Again, that architect is not necessarily needing to be God, but there has to be some sort of architectural principle or, dare I say, outside intelligence in the universe that has caused these things to be in exactly the way that they are. If it should be that we're stuck with the universe that we, that we have, then we have to, in some cases, discount option three and option four. That basically, um, there's not an infinite number of universes, even though that's a popular culture thing, or a popular science thing that maybe we're seeing a little bit more shaky ground for, and that we're not going from the, with the argument from ignorance, that we simply don't know the factors of which has arisen, but we still believe the universe is random. We're stuck with number one or number two. Do we say that God has preconditioned the universe to be as it is, or is the universe a happy accident? Which among these gives the more uh, particular explanatory power? Now, Beale and um, Polkinghorne as theists argue that the theistic perspective, in the broadest sense, is the more powerful argument in the probability. This, again, can be something that we can disagree with, but the arrangement of the arguments from science itself, from what we are seeing within the process of the scientific principles, is something in which is not a differentiation between the religious over here and the scientific over here. That is a false dichotomy. Rather, from the principles of which we can understand the universe as arising, we can make a, a, a concerted fine-tuning argument that has existed for a good number of years and has had some pretty good analysis done behind it as this is can be put forward as a viable argument that this particular fine-tuning, the anthropic fine-tuning, is in fact a better explanation for what we get in the widest sense possible. But now we're going to dive into to two particular uh, prongs of what Dawkins attempts to argue ad contra. The two particular ones that are quoted directly from his book that bring up particularly the problem with fine-tuning that he wants to argue against are twofold. The first is that the argument that God is the cause or God is the first mover, or God is the outside intelligence that gives these particular objective observances of the universe, these six anthropic principles, their meat, can be explained by other means. Okay, so there is a different explanation than God. Okay, what is Dawkins going to say about this? 
he argues that this can be explained by the suggestion that there are multiple universes. And of course, again, we elaborate about those multiple universes. So in principle, what the argument is, is that, okay, God is not the explanation for how the universe is. Therefore, what is another argument for this? Well, from a biologist's perspective and from his particular training, the way that you can view the universe as arising is if there is no God or no anthropic principle, there's no architect or intelligence that has tuned the universe as it is, then we have to have some sort of explanatory principle that is making a meaning out of this that we can perhaps um, say is reliable. One of the ways in which we can talk about this is that it's just a happy accident. It just happens to be that this is the way in which the universe has arisen. But another stronger way you could put this is that there are all kinds of universes out there in which we, in a minuscule sort of perspective, are simply one of the ones that survived based upon these preconditions being particularly set within our universe relative to other universes that exist. Now, the reason why this is a stronger argument than simply the universe has arisen by a happy accident and this is the only one we're stuck with is, honestly, by an argument of probability. In probabilities, the bigger the number of possible interactions that you can have, the perhaps more likely you can find the needle in the haystack, so to speak. Um, if there is a giant haystack and there's one needle in it, it's way more probable that it was a random happenstance that there is a needle in the haystack, so to speak, or there is uh, such a minuscule point uh, in which we can find um, this one thing in the midst of all of these interactions. It's a much more probable way of talking about the minuscule sorts of tuning of the universe that has such a low probability that when if we're stuck with the universe that we're at, we have a significantly low number of universes to try to explain. In other words, if we only have one universe that we're stuck with, how did that one universe get here? It's a lower sort of um, probability that this universe arises randomly than if we have a significantly large amount of universes, maybe near an infinite amount of universes, in which the needle in the haystack is simply our universe. To give the logical credit here, at least as it comes to the argument structure, that is the stronger argument between the two. However, however, as Polkinghorne and Beale have pointed out, the problem with this argument is that it's based upon either an assumption about the physical universe, of which we perhaps have been trying to prove for a number of years, that is showing to be less and less likely the case, which is what Polkinghorne and Beale argue is the case. But the other thing with this is that just because there is a significantly low um, probability that a universe like ours existed actually introduces other factors of fine-tuning that actually strengthen the other argument that is made about God's existence and intelligence in the universe. Let me explain what I mean by this. Um, those who have worked in, um, in statistics will know maybe where I'm going by this, but um, the statistical analysis of the likelihood of something happening is, by at least some definitions, it is more likely the case that something has occurred, even if it is improbable, if you have certain constants about what we're dealing with and certain constants that are piling up, in other words, that there are more and more and more constants that make it so that our universe and the way that it existed exists in the way that it does and not by simply a random circumstance. That gives credence to the ability of creationists to say that there was a creation. But the thing is, though, is as I just said, if you have more and more and more constant factors that show that the universe has a minuscule chance of happening the way that it does, it actually lends more statistical credence that an outside intelligence has, uh, to, for lack of a better term, monkeyed with the system, such that these things arise in the way that they should. It's sort of like saying 
when I flip a coin, there is a 50-50 chance that heads will land. Okay? So there's a significantly high probability that I will get tails and a significantly high probability that I'll get heads. However, when you flip a coin five times, there is a significantly low probability in the ways in which this works mathematically that I will get five heads in a row. In an individual circumstance, I can flip a coin each time and flip and flip and flip and flip, and each one of these in, uh, isolated from each other have a 50-50 chance of landing heads or tails. But if I were to string them all together and say if I flip these coins all in a row and all of these will have their result, it is a statistically lower probability that I flip in a string of commands all of these in a certain way and all five of them will land heads every time. So the question as it comes to the anthropic principles in this particular case is that if we have more factors than just six that have to be fine-tuned, and they are fine-tuned, and we have tested that they're fine-tuned, it is more likely the probability that some outside force has done this. So if there are multiple universe, near infinite amount of universe, in which, in which our universe is the needle in the haystack, it actually turns out to be the case that there are other principles that have lined up such that our universe exists, such that our universe exists in the way that we can observe it, and that our universe exists in a way that other universes don't exist, and it adds probability to the fact that there's an exterior intelligence that designed the universe, because it adds more fine-tuned principles into the equation, statistically making it a higher probability that God did it, rather than it arising randomly. Basically what Beale and uh, Polkinghorne are trying to say is that by Dawkins' suggestion of the multi multiverse theory, he actually lends credence in an argumentative sense to the argument of God creating the universe. Again, this is not something that you need to write down and know when someone asks you, but it's simply something that is pointed out in this bare argument if this actually was true, this could actually be a strengthening of the argument of fine-tuning and not its doing away with it. Now, again, that, uh, that might be very difficult to understand. I apologize if it is, but this is something that other scientists who are of faith, who are of theism, actually put forward as counter-arguments against the idea of multiversal theory, even if it did exist. And so the thing is, is that it doesn't actually get rid of the anthropic principle of fine-tuning. It actually strengthens it. So that's the first one. But the second prong is one that is fundamental for us to understand about the relationship of God to the universe. And this is one in which Dawkins makes a significant broad sweeping statement that is built off of some confusions even found within perhaps our regular practitioners and believers in theism. Here's what Dawkins is trying to say in the second one. Any god capable of designing a universe carefully and foresightedly tuned to lead to our evolution must be a supremely complex and improbable entity who needs an even bigger explanation than the one he is supposed to provide. When Dawkins says this, what he's, what he's uh, attempting to argue is that God because of the complexity in which life has arisen, that God's simplicity means that there has to be some sort of more complex um, ex uh, explanation for God himself, which is prior to God in some way in order to explain how the system works as complexly as it does. Now, flag the word complexity, okay? What are we meaning by complexity and what does Dawkins mean by complexity? And most importantly, what do theists mean by complexity or simplicity? One of the confusions that Dawkins makes in this particular argument is what exactly the subtleties of divine simplicity mean. Polkinghorne puts this very flatly. In the Christian tradition, what divine simplicity very, very clearly means is that God's 
existence or essence is exactly equal to his action. That the simplicity of God is that God's essence is his action, and if that is the case, God in his omnipresence, omniscience, all-powerful, all-altruistic, the all of these sort of, of uh, particular ways, God is perfectly sustained within the divine self, such that God needs no other for him to be necessary. Um, God is not contingent on anything other than simply the divine self-sufficiency, which in the Christian tradition is seen in the self-sufficiency of the community of persons of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in that, the simplicity, quote-unquote, of God is that it's that God's very existence is God's action such that God is never acting in a way that is contrary to God's very existence. God acts perfectly loving towards the universe all the time because that is who God is. God acts perfectly all-powerfully within the universe uh, because that is who God is. And in those particular cases, God is intimately involved relationally with the universe because that's who God is. That's what we mean by the divine simplicity. Okay? It's not that, it is not that, the ways in which God interacts with the universe is simple. This is the main confusion that happens in this argument. It's not that God has a simple interaction with the universe. No, that's not what theists mean by this. And that's what no theist believes this. No theist believes that God's interaction with the universe is simple in that case. God's interaction with the universe is extremely, divinely complex. Things that, in fact, in the, uh, in, in the particular tradition of Christianity, we actually affirm we can never know the depths of. Because, again, if God's action is equivalent with God's person, we can never know the depths of God because God is an infinite sort of being. We are finite by our very capacities. And so the reason why this is important is because, number one, God does not interact with the universe in a non-complex fashion. That is a misnomer between the ways in which Dawkins uses that language and which theists actually use the language of simplicity. But the other particular thing about this is that the pre-explanations for God. In other words, well, if God interacts in this way, there has to be some principle that's before God, in which, again, theists have said there is not because of a fundamental confusion as to the nature of who God is. One of the main ways in which Dawkins treats God in his book, The God Delusion, is as an object in the physical universe, something in which theists do not do. And so this is the reason why in previous chapters we've flagged this very strongly, is because when Dawkins makes this sort of um, precondition for God argument, this actually is an argument that theists do not make, and that which is a complete misrepresentation of the whole theistic idea of God in the first place. God, for theists, is not an object in the universe. But let's, let's at least take Dawkins at his word. If God was an object in the universe, if God was an object in the universe, the argument is, is that, well, God's interactions are so complex that they can't simply be simple. There has to be a previous explanation for God's complexity. But this is more of a, um, this is more of, of, a, of a tenuous definition as it comes to mathematics in general. To use um, the example of um, Polkinghorne and Nicholas Beale, if we have a right triangle with one being the length of both sides, we know that 1 squared plus 1 squared is equal to the hypotenuse squared. When we have 1 squared plus 1 squared, that means that 2 is equal to the hypotenuse squared. That means that the hypotenuse is the square root of 2. Great, that's, that's awesome. We, we, we've solved the problem, right? Except that it's a very simple thing for us to say the square, the square root of 2. It is a significantly more complex thing to describe exactly what the number the square root of 2 actually represents, because the square root of 2 is a non-repeating decimal. And that means that there is an infinite amount of numbers that this goes out to in its specificity. And if that's the case, the thing is that the square root of 2, as simple as that is to describe, is incredibly complex to try to get to the actual writing out of the number. 
Probably an easier example of this is the number pi, um, or the Greek letter pi that is represented whenever we talk about spheres or circles. And the thing is, is that 3.14 is the a rough approximation of that number, but it is not the depths of that number because it is a non-repeating decimal, 3.1415 all the way out until however uh, uh, much uh, the re most recent supercomputer has computed that to. Basically what this is, is it's, it's, it's describing, it's very simple to write the concept of pi, and it's also very accurate to write the concept of pi as it comes to the ways in which we calculate circles, spheres, and so on and so forth, but it is most certainly not simple whenever we try to get down to the depths of that. It's sort of the argument, if God is an object in the physical universe, because we believe that numbers, logic, pi, and things are descriptors of the physical universe, if we replace God with the square root of 2, it would be as if, well, the square root of 2 is so complex, there has to be a pre-explanation for that complexity. The thing is, is that that doesn't mean that that particular explanation of complexity is not true. Therefore, even if God, in Dawkins's argument, had a previous, or a previous explanation for, that does not actually mean that God doesn't exist. It actually means that God most certainly exists if Dawkins's case is to be believed, and that God is actually an explanation of this particular complex, uh, complex arrangement. So, Again, it doesn't get rid of the problem of God. It simply displaces the problem of God with, an, with something that happens before God. But now to get back to the theistic argument. Now the theistic argument against Dawkins is that is a mischaracterization of who God is and how God acts. God is not an actor that is confined within the physical universe, such that God is simply a cause among many. Rather, as Thomas Aquinas and other theologians and Polkinghorne himself would say, God is the arising of anything in the first place. God is the arising of the anthropic principles to begin with. God is the intelligence that has set these things in such a way and is involved in these things in such a way as to have life arise. And that um, even if we were to take those arguments on themselves, the thing that is confusing about them is that they make, they make some uh, typological confusions, especially in this second one that we're talking about, such that it's actually difficult to pin down all of the confusions in simply one simple sentence. But I would like to sum up all of today's talk, uh, because again, this is some heady stuff. This might, not be your, this might not be your favorite class that you get in this book. It will get better, I promise. But for you who are really interested in this, the main point of these two chapters is that in the ways in which the anthropic principle functions, we have six particular and potentially more that we haven't discovered yet, six particular objective principles and forces in the universe that we have reliably tested as being as close to objective as possible that if they were even so minusculely messed with that they were different to begin with, the universe itself would never have existed in the way that we understand it. And likewise, the universe would actually have either collapsed on itself or would have exploded in an instant. But rather, the way that we actually are able to see existence in and of itself is based off of these six scientific principles. And that these six scientific principles provide the backbone of the argument from a theistic point of view, for the universe is not an accident. God had something to do with it. And that the way in which we explain these six anthropic principles in any way, shape, or form is in the arguments that are put forward that are uh, arguably four of them. It is either the case, because of these anthropic principles, that there's an exterior intelligence, God, that set these in these ways and is involved in these in some way, such that the universe arises at all. Number two, the universe is the only one we have, and it's just a happy accident that the preconditions of the universe involved these six, probably more, anthropic principles in which all of these things had to have been absolutely perfect for the cake to pop out of the oven. So, it's a happy accident, 
And this is the explanation for it. Number three, a modification of number two, which is that we have an infinite number of universes. We have the haystack. And our universe is the needle in the haystack, in which it so happens that our universe does exist based upon these infinite possibilities, and that we are simply a product of an infinite possibility of random chance that these things arises in this certain way that we are able to actually make this needle in the haystack of the universe. Okay, that's the third option. And the fourth option is that the universe we believe arises randomly, but we don't know the preconditions for that random arising just yet. Those are the four options that Polkinghorne wants to put in front of us from a philosophical perspective. And what he's trying to say is that numbers three and four not only don't make physical sense, but also have scant little evidence that suggests that they are actually on the table. Number four from a logical sense, and number three from an actual physical sense in the arising of the universe. Therefore, we're only left with numbers one and two as possibilities. And from the argument that Polkinghorne and Beale want to put forward, it is more likely the case in these sort of explanatory sets of material that to have these fine-tuned principles such that life could exist at all or the universe could exist at all is more likely to be explained by a god loving the universe into being in the ways in which classical theism describes rather than it being the only universe we have and it simply being a happy accident.